Um, so thank you, Brie, for meeting with us. Um, so I think we can get started. I wanted to, my first question is quite simple. I was wondering if you could um, open by telling us a bit about your practice in general, and then we'll talk more about these works here behind you. Yeah, um, I want to say thank you first to everyone who's here today. I wish that I could have your bodies sharing this space with me. I think I would be a lot less nervous. <laughs> um, but here I am talking to my laptop. Um, so I, my practice started with a in deep interest in clay. And I would say that it's been guided mostly by the evolution of that relationship um, what the material itself is capable of. Um, in my work, I, I push it to its limit. So I have really developed an understanding and that's ongoing and I'm always learning, but um, kind of what its personality is, what its um, tendencies are, um, what's its breaking point. Um, and that, um, has really determined a lot of the interactions that I have with the material. So um, it's a very immersive practice that where um, I don't, I know Magdalene is about to ask this question later, but I feel like I have to jump into it. Um, that it's immersive because I'm working with 130 pounds of clay, which is my body weight. And so it's an amount of clay that's so, um, resistant that's so that has so much mass that it's pushing back against me as much as I'm pushing against it so they're like going back to where I started with this, this relationship with the material and then um, recently it's in the past few years the material itself has opened up a new um, relationship to understand which is the clay's relationship to the earth and then my relationship to the earth so that's kind of the house. Those are like the fundamentals. Right. Um, and I'm going to ask, actually, I got a comment in the chat that you, your volume's a little bit low. So maybe, um, yeah, maybe you can move a little bit closer. Yeah, because we can still see the work really well. And um, hopefully that'll be more helpful to um, everyone. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. If anyone's having trouble, just send us a, a message. That, thanks for doing that. Um, yeah, that's a great introduction. I mean, I would be curious to hear more about um, the idea of working with your body weight. Um, you know, sort of what made you start working this way and how does, maybe how does that work physically and in reality, how does that feel? Yeah, um, I started working that way because I wanted to not, I didn't want to be the one that was entire, I didn't want to be entirely in charge of the form of the sculpture itself. I didn't want to be totally in control of that. I wanted the form to come out of a relationship, to come out of an interaction, to be formed by um, gesture, by um, impact, by confrontation, sometimes by collaboration um and so i i hope that that reads in the work is that these forms are the results of gestures um and they aren't representational they're not um something that's entirely predetermined um and because i'm working with so much material there are unknowns and um resistances that will guide the, the um, resulting form. So the way that I often work is with the, starting with the clay piled in the center of the floor, um, usually on a piece of plastic or paper. Um, and I literally get on top of it and start, I usually have a score that I begin to work with. Um, the one that I've used the most and that is the oldest is spreading outward from center, which is how these um, two pieces behind me were begun, um, which is where I, sp I spread the clay out um, as far as I can reach. So from the center out, it's like an arm span and turn radially as I continue to spread. And that score kind of came to me as like a, a way of 
metaphorically connecting or relating to my environment, thinking about as a woman occupying space, um, thinking about my relationship to the environment, to our direct environments, whether it's architecture or um, the natural environment. And that's really interesting. And then in terms of, so the two works that are on either side of you right now are the ones that are included in uh, Freeze. So those are your newest works, right? Yeah. Yes, and I made them like in a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> um, they're amazing. And I was wondering, I, I mean, it seems like the way you use the glaze and uh, the color was also related to movement. Um, can you speak to that a little bit too? Yeah, so that's a kind of a new thing in my work where um, there's the gesture embedded in the clay, but like the impressions in the clay and the form. And then I'm adding this like new gesture, which is done through glaze. Um, so in the past, the, the glaze application has been a bit more all over or um, to transform the material. So like, I, I used a lot of metallic glazes in the past to kind of push the material in like a different register of understanding. Like, it's, and um, so now I'm using the glaze in a more abstract expressionistic way, perhaps, um, especially on this piece. So the, the way that I applied the glaze on this piece, can you hear me okay, my friend? Yes, yes, thanks. <laughs> so um, it was on the floor drying, and I stood in the center and had a cup of glaze, um, like this brown glaze, and made this, um, just like big arcing gesture with the brown glaze. And then I did it also with this kind of eggplant color. Um, and then again, in like the middle with the metallic glaze. And what was interesting is that it's pouring glaze from a cup, cup is something that you can't control that well. And that wasn't the goal anyway, but it was to have this, this, um, ex like the glaze becoming a kind of extension of movement. And it created these quite oblong circles, which to my surprise fell off of the edge of the piece, which was the, the reason for um, this use of stones to kind of complete this circular gesture with the glaze. Um, similarly, um, in this one, with the, the red glaze, which was used in a way actually like there are numbers embedded in the surface of this piece so it goes from one to to nine there are 12 sections and the numbers kind of disappear but um the red glaze in this piece was used as a way of kind of disorienting that clock so the beginning where the glaze starts, like the thickest part of the glaze is not really where the clock starts. So there's this um, dis dissonance between like how, how we keep track of time or how, how time really aligns with our experience. It's really interesting that that's a new thing for you and that it would, you know, you'd kind of go into this direction of disorientation or reorientation um, this year. <laughs> Um, is that, I guess that sounds like that was something maybe not, um, more, it's something more subconscious than it was intentional. Yeah, I think so. Um, it was something that I had been thinking about in the spring, obviously with what we've all been going through, um, this feeling like the rug's been pulled out from under you and you've lost your compass and you like don't know which direction is forward anymore. And though I didn't directly translate that into making spiraling circles of glaze on my pieces, <laughs> it kind of um, came out that way. And it's, it's funny too that, and I don't know how to interpret this yet, but um, the pieces are starting to take on this like kind of celestial, Mm -hmm. um quality and a friend said something really beautiful which is like 
piece. Looking at your piece is like looking up at the sky. I was like, that's so interesting because when I make the pieces, they're on the ground, right? So they are facing the sky when I make them. Um, and the, but they're also deeply like rooted in the earth and in the ground. So they're kind of bridging these two worlds. But I don't know what that means in that's relation to what they're going through. That's a really way to, beautiful way of thinking about it. I mean, I, that sort of, um, I was going to ask this later, but I was also thinking about the titles you've given the works, um, turning inward and spreading outward, finding balance. Um, it, it really ties into what you're saying about, you know, on the one hand, it's like, you know, your friend says that it's like looking into space or that there's something galactic about it, but it's also so grounded mm. um, materially and in your process. Like, how yeah. did that, what do the titles um, mean to you in relation to these works? Yeah, that's, thank you. I didn't actually make that connection between that and that. But um, <laughs> the inward and outward, the way that I've been using it in the titles is to, to um, acknowledge that, like, the pieces have an, an inward directionality, like, in terms of, like, going into their own centers. And then the... But, and that's something that's entirely their personality, I think, like, because I'm not making an inward gesture, they, but they are, they are um, looking inward, I think, or opening up a center. And then the gesture that I'm making is outward, right? So those two opposing gestures are happening at the same time in the pieces. And then I think I put finding balance in that title in regard to this piece, because when I saw that the circles of glaze fell off the edge of the piece, I was like, now it's, it's, um, it feels unbalanced or it feels like, like topsy-turvy. Um, and if someone looking at it recently was like, I can't tell if like the lower side is bigger than the upper, upper quadrant and, or if like there's just a kind of game being played on my, in my vision like of how to get like where the weight of the piece really is and that's why I put those stones was to kind of like balance the asymmetry that was happening in the piece but it applies to to a more metaphorical existential experience definitely and you I mean I think you used the word dizzying at one point in your writing um to describe I, maybe the process too, but definitely that that final result of the works. Yeah, yeah, I think I hope so. I mean, I like that you pick you that resonates with you that it mm -hmm. to like a disorienting experience in the world. Mm -hmm. um, to I just to speak about the glaze a little bit more. I was wondering if there's. Um, you know, how do you choose your colors? Does it have a specific resonance for you or is that also sort of intuitive? Um, the palettes have for the past while um, been really drawn from different landscapes that I've felt really connected to. So, um, well, I mean, this piece does have like a, a bit of a darker relationship to color, which is, um, there is a it's a black center and um we spoke earlier about this pieces um reflecting on the idea of deep time and um so this i think that this piece touches on, on a lot more kind of darker or um uh, insidious um and maybe even apocalyptic um like tones um there are other pieces um that i've shown recent there that I'm, i've been making recently that have more colors of the desert in their palette so like some kind of grass um wheat colors and um terracotta colors purples and blues um this Actually, I, don't, I mean, I think that this piece was made like thinking about um, the, the, the booth with Tao was to, um, in a direction of 
mm, well, I can't speak to her work, but um, something that had a more maybe neutral palette. I don't know, softer, subtler. And the, um, I think you also said that with these works or sort of more recent works, you've started introducing um, materials like stone and rubble. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe the one that's the third one there behind you also has that in a really visual way. Um, yeah. What made you start introducing that material? Um, your works? It, well, it, it kind of began in this work mm -hmm. um, and works like this, where I wanted to pull in these materials from our physical environment to create like a, di a dialogue between the ceramic and the geology that it comes from. Mm -hmm. um, also to create a relationship between the piece and the physical world um, that we often are disconnected from. Um, and I wrote about the stones in this particular piece as acting a bit like a dam that maybe like holds in the energy that's like expanding from the, from its center. Um, the spiraling piece or like the cycling piece that's on the other wall, um, that piece is composed of one ceramic form that spirals and then um, an assortment of rebel rocks and ceramic rocks that I made myself um, just out of smashed clay and glaze. And the reason that I wanted to pull those materials together was to kind of broach the conversation of like, how do you know when something's falling apart or coming together? Like, and when do you let something um, fall apart and decide to build anew? Or like, at what point do we really um, start realizing that we do need to build things and what do we use? Like, do we use things that are already existing in the environment or do we make new things? Um, so the rubble came from a pile near my studio, the stones I collected from trips and they're from my backyard. Um, and I think that like one of the things that I was su most surprised by in that piece was that the accumulation of stones and rubble kind of reads like it's suspended in, in either coming together or falling apart. So, it, but then like the motion of the piece itself almost has its own like gravitational spin. So it's like kind of the matter is staying together because of that. Um, that movement. Mm -hmm. and it's very poetic too in relationship to the other two works, you know, sort of not knowing if it's coming together or falling apart, if it's inward or outward. Um, and, you know, having a tension between those two things is really, um, I guess, the, something in common with them. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you did mention uh, you, the term deep time. Um, and I thought, it, I thought your insights into it were so fascinating. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about what deep time means to you and your practice yeah. and what it means maybe in general. <laughs> I mean, it's something that I'm learning for the, very newly um, mm -hmm. through reading about the Anthropocene and um, anthropologists and sociologists and ecologists take on what we're, what's happening to the planet, what we're doing to the planet. Um, and that's also something I've been thinking about in terms of my relationship to this material, which is a material that's extracted from the earth. It's part of like an industry of extraction that keeps our um, modern way of life possible. And so deep time refers to the period of time that these resources that we extract from our planet took to form. So they stretch into the past millions and millions of years, right? Like when we unearth fossil fuels, though, those are materials that through compression and through, you know, whatever happens underground, um, took millions of years to become what it is, like diamonds, I suppose. Um, 
and then our industrial extraction um, capital, like society that we are now extracting those resources and have been only for about a hundred years. And the relationship between human time to these materials that we're burning so quickly, that we're digging out of the earth so quickly um, and you know, have the potential to exhaust. So that idea of um, what are we, like what's now my relationship to millions of years ago through this, with, through this clay. And I'm moving into new um, projects that um, address my own responsibility to um, the material that I use in my practice. And I don't have any answers yet, but it's something that, um, you know, I want to address. Yeah, I mean, and there's a lot there in terms of, um, you know, these ancient resources and also this sort of undertone of um, thinking about the cosmos and, and ancient material and knowledge and atmosphere that um, seems like very embedded in what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's, yeah, that's another, that's so true. And like, what can we learn from these mm -hmm. materials? And also like, um, something that we, we wrote about was how do we, um, how do we have like trust and develop a way of knowing about our world that's, that's rooted in the body instead of the mind. And so what is like through material and physical interaction, like what do we learn from the, the non-human and geological world that we rely so heavily on. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of material, um, something else uh, we had spoken about before was, um, so, and, it, and it's sort of attached to what you're saying here, um, you know, categorizing materials through, let's say, um, art history, which is very, um, you know, the art historical canon, art historical canon is so uh, patriarchal in the way we understand this sort of linear uh, cause effect um, history. And oftentimes materials like the ones that you work in could be relegated to, you know, women's art or feminist art, but in a way that's not conceptual, in a way that's more um, us falling back into those um, ways of thinking. Um, and yet your work seems to um, subvert that, even though it is using materials that would traditionally maybe be thought of as women's um, materials. I hate to use that term. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about the way you think about that, um, if, if and how feminism uh, factors into your practice. Um, if you could speak about that a little bit. Yeah, I think being a woman and making sculpture and taking up space in the way that these pieces do, um, I do make um, a, some floor pieces as well, but that that does feel, um, you know, something that's, that's challenging to do, like taking space being visible is not something that socially I felt encouraged to do. Um, so that it's, that is a kind of personal relationship to feminism, um, as well as just the way that these pieces move through my studio and through the world in, in small pieces that are easy for me to install and manage on my own. I don't have to be reliant on a larger um, system for help in that, in that, in that like my body can, is capable of, of moving, you know, the way that I make a living, like is through moving these pieces through the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and is it, and I, I think I read before, if, correct me if I'm wrong, that you sort of think of your sculptures, especially due to, um, you know, the way you make them and their weight and everything, uh, you do think of them as having their own agency, as almost being bodies on, onto themselves. Is that true? I do. I think that, I, I mean, I do because I, I do have moments with the pieces when they're done and on the wall where they feel like they've become something else. 
and I feel like I learned something from them. And so I know that they're not just containing like what I put into them. You know, there there's something. Uh, I really like the Helma Atlin documentary. Really resonated with me, in, in that she described her practice as one where she was a conduit for energy that was beyond herself. And I I hope that that is also happening in my practice and um, that there are a lot of things to learn from, um, from what's beyond us. And yeah, so I do look at the pieces like they're teachers. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely something transformative in creating it, um, you know, especially in the way you make it with your body. Um, that's really, um, I think that's what I meant by subversive, you know, just creating in this way and creating objects that take up space in the way that they do is um, really a gesture of, of resistance um, against sort of patriarchal assumptions about uh, women, women's work, um, if we're to say that. Um, there is actually someone has asked a question, so uh, which is great. Um, I can read it. Hi, Brie. On the subject of the environment and landscape, can you speak about where some of your works are made and how they connect to those spaces and landscapes? And one more question was, um, how was your time in the desert? <laughs> was this, who is this from? Is this, this from is someone else? Kadar Brock. Oh, Kadar. <laughs> <laughs> um, my... Um, I've spent a, some time in New Mexico and Nevada and Utah. I'm from Southern California. And I think even though I left there when I was 18, I still have such a, that's like, I still, I think of being in a long-term relationship with the Western desert. Um, so I visit it often and it feeds me. Um, and so this northern part of Nevada is where I've been most invested in recently, drawing palettes from my palettes from there. Um, also really listening to, trying to be open and listen to what it has to tell me. Um, so I'm like seeing things there that are so subtle, I think, that might go unnoticed, something as simple as a cattle fence. Um, that really is an indicator of the way that we've, you know, colonized the land through cattle and the way that we've changed the ecology um, or the gold mine that's like down the road, like Nevada is full of gold mines, open pit mining. Um, what are the people's relationships to those mines historically too speaking? Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm trying, what I find so special about the desert is that because of the climate and you know the absence of water or la less water um, and the dryness, these impressions of our interventions in the land, the history of human use of the land is so visible, like if you're looking for it. And um, so I've been diving into those stories and, and I went out to Nevada in June and um, it, it was great because before I left, I think a lot of you can relate that with the pandemic and with, you know, everything with um, social movements that are so necessary right now and the pain that that's, um, that that's really becoming visible to us. Um, I was so in my emotional body for months before I left and stuck in small spaces. And then when I went out to the desert, I got really, really pushed into my physical body by the unrelenting wind and the heat and the sun and the extreme cold at night. And I was camping. So it was like really feeling my physical body, which was a great um, kind of shock to the system. That's so interesting. That was a long answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was amazing, though. Thank you for the question. Um, and if I've, anyone else has a question, please feel free to uh, type it or you can unmute at this point. We have a few minutes um, left. So if you have a question for Brie, now's the time. Um, 
but I mean, I went through my questions, but now I have a follow-up, which is I'm because I am really fascinated by the process and perhaps how it might have changed this year. Um, I mean, I think that that answer about being in the desert is so interesting in terms of even like reorienting in your body and feelings like of touch, you know, the wind touching you. Um, and I was wondering if the process of making these new works, maybe was it, did you feel it was different? Like, did you feel a catharsis um, in that sort of level of contact um, with, with the earth and with natural materials? Hmm. I think that the inclusion of the stones and like the geological material, I think mm -hmm. that that was, must have been where that came from, was like wanting to bring a piece of that experience into the work. I think that because the pieces that I make out in the desert that are ephemeral, which we haven't even touched upon, but I do make pieces in relationship to um, certain sites in the desert and those pieces fade away and melt over time, but I learned something through making those pieces and those those feelings and those um, those lessons come into the studio and come into the pieces that I make here. So I, yeah, I think for sure like these pieces came from that time. Oh, that's fascinating. And can you um, say a little bit about the de works that you made in the desert, the ephemeral ones? Yeah, um, I called Dick Blick a, a month before I went out there to make sure that they would save, you know, 300 pounds of clay for me. Oh, wow. <laughs> the shortage of, you know, people couldn't ship stuff around, um, at that time. So I was like, hold on to that for me. I'm paying for it now. And um, picked that up. And so I made two um, red terracotta clay pieces out in the desert um, that were in dialogue with the impressions that I described earlier that I notice in the land. Um, so they engage with the specificity of the site. Um, I'm using an aerial drone camera to like, shoot these pieces. I'll, I'll be showing them with Night Gallery in November. Um, so that you, the relationship between the piece and the, the terrain is, um, becomes like a composition. Um, and I've, I've made them also like last fall. So when I went back in June, I got to visit these pieces that had dissolved in different ways um, over the winter and spring seasons. So there's some photos of that. Um, yeah, there, I just get to go out there and like not have any witness, you know, even um, to myself and just be there and respond, so. Mm -hmm. And, um, and how, do, how does your studio practice relate to that? I mean, I feel like we're very lucky to see your studio right now. I always like seeing how um, artists work. Um, yeah. it does, like, how does that um, space affect you differently? It's, diff it's definitely different. I mean, when I'm in the city, I definitely feel more of like a, Kind of compression happening and when i'm in the desert it i feel like there's expansive um energy and um so i like that you use the word resistance because i think that there is some resistant energy here for me and so i am working kind of sometimes with that and sometimes against it mm -hmm. um there's, a, I don't have an example up right now, but there's a body of work that um, I made last fall that was made um, by spreading out 130 pounds of clay in like a very thin sheet on the floor. And then um, I'd get off of it and kind of leverage myself off of some boxes that I had on the floor and push that sheet of clay against um, the wall. So it would gather and compress kind of like an accordion or like a gathered um, comforter or dense piece of fabric. And that body of work is very New York body of work <laughs> that like reflects on that um, 
you know, the pressure that's around us. And it's not just so interesting. Yeah. It's not just social pressure. It's like, I think it's just the energy of the city is there's just a, not that it's a negative energy, but that it's, um, spatial pressure maybe it's just, it's just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it I mean I've I've actually learned a lot about your work in this um in this talk I mean I guess I always thought about you you talk about resistance I always would think about um the resistance between you your body your labor and then the, the actual material but there's so much um opposing resistance even in the works themselves uh, you know in terms of directional um, gestures and visual gestures too as you say with the works behind you that are um, in the freeze booth just how even the glaze sort of works against the direction of the of the material itself it's um, it was it's been really great to learn more about that thank you I really I really love what you just said that's so <laughs> that's so true there are a lot of like different forces happening in the work yeah, within the work, but also beyond it. Yeah, yeah I'm relieved you agree. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Uh, we're at the end of our time. I mean, if someone had a, a question they wanted to ask very quickly, um, we're here still. Um, but if not, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, and thank you, Bree, so much. It was such a great discussion and amazing to learn about your new work. Yeah, um, and so very fun. special to see you next to it <laughs> yeah such a treat it's like we're kind of in london but yeah <laughs> we're kind of in london but more casual <laughs> okay thank you, well, thank you so much and thank you everyone for coming and have a great day okay bye, bye.